Welcome to Wycliffe College and uh, to this event, which is co-sponsored by Wycliffe College and Regis College here at the Toronto School of Theology, uh, the place where evangelicals and Jesuits are friends. Um, and um, we'd like to welcome uh, very warmly uh, William Cavanaugh of DePaul University to Wycliffe College um, to speak on the topic of secularization and idolatry. I believe, Bill, that it is a work in progress, uh, from a work in progress you have. But to give uh, Bill a, a fuller introduction, I'm going to invite Dr. John Berkman of Regis College, my colleague, to come forward. And I'm uh, happy, happy first to say that Regis College is very happy to co-sponsor. Uh, Professor Kavanaugh's lecture. Um, as some of you, I'm sure, already know, uh, Professor Kavanaugh is author of books such as uh, Torture and Eucharist, Theopolitical Imagination, Being Consumed, Myth of Religious Violence, and a number of other books. And I could mention a lot more of those, but I thought it might be more interesting to have my introduction uh, to tell you a little bit about my own background with Bill, since I have known him for some 30 years now, um, since we were graduate students together. Um, and um, uh, one other very important publication uh, I want you to know about is uh, an essay he wrote um, in a book I edited called The Howard Wasp Reader. He wrote the introductory essay. And one of the um, interesting things about that essay, besides learning a lot about uh, the life of Stanley Howard Wasp, is also noting uh, Bill's um, ability to be humorous and write theologically, which is no mean feat, uh, as I'm sure any of you who read a lot of theology will know. Um, and um, uh, one of the things uh, uh, about Bill that you probably don't know is while he was still a master's student at Cambridge University, he, among other things, entered into a stand-up comedy uh, contest uh, in which he came second, uh, first prize going to a friend of the judges. <laughs> um, so I'm not sure how much of that will be on display. The other thing is that Bill and I had a rather traumatic experience together in graduate school. Uh, and some of you uh, may know that where we went to graduate school, Duke University, is uh, actually not famed particularly for academic, academia, but for its basketball team. And for those of you who are not interested in basketball, they have a coach who's uh, called uh, Mike Krzyzewski or Coach K, who um, has been voted America's greatest coach. He's won more basketball games than any other coach in American history. So he's rather an icon at Duke University. And uh, many years ago, Bill and I were um, racquetball partners. And one day, we went into the building and it was empty and uh, there was nobody signed up for the slot that was coming up in five minutes. So of course, we just put our name down on that slot and went over to the court, and, but it was occupied. And we looked in and there was Coach K playing racquetball with somebody else. And we looked at each other, it's like, I don't know, do you think we should knock him? Yeah, it's like, knock him. Coach K comes, oh, just give, us, just give us five minutes. So then we stand outside, we leave five minutes, and they're playing away. So uh, Bill says, come on, let's knock it, knock the game. Coach K comes to the door and he goes, oh, walks up. We got into the court and I turned to Bill. And Bill was like, do you think we should get Coach K out of the racquetball court? Bill goes, what's he going to do? Bench us? <laughs> <laughs> And with that, I welcome Bill Cap. <laughs> oh, shoot. Now you're going to expect me to be funny. I'm too old to be funny anymore. Sorry. Um, thanks, John, for that uh, kind introduction. Is this too loud? Are you, it's all right? Yeah. Um, it's really nice to be here. Um, thanks for the invitation. It's great to be here with two old friends, uh, John Berkman and uh, Joe Mangina. And... Um, uh, it's really nice to be here on the day after the Blue Jays secured the victory in the series. I'm a long-time and long-suffering Cubs fan. And so uh, I just watched the Cubs make the series. Now the Blue Jays made the series, and I'm hoping they're going to meet in the World Series. I think that would be really uh, a great meeting of two long-suffering fan bases. The last time the Cubs won the World Series was 1908. And so, um, I, I mean, granted, every team has a bad century now and then, but, uh, <laughs> um, but I'm really excited uh, about this. Anyway, um, thanks. Uh, so today, I'd, I, I want to talk about two books, one that I've written and one that I'm working on or, or would be working on if I wasn't going to committee meetings and so on. 
But um, I know it's kind of self-indulgent to talk about one's own work, but I intend this to be kind of a communal thought exercise. It is, as Joe said, uh, a work in progress. So I want to float some ideas for this book that I'm allegedly working on, and I want you to help me uh, write this uh, book. So a a lot of what I'm going to say is, is preliminary thoughts on this. So a few years ago, I published The Myth of Religious Violence, in which I argued that there's no good reason for thinking that religions are more prone to violence than secular ideologies, because there's no essential difference between religious and secular types of devotion. People kill for all sorts of things. Killing for a god is not essentially different than killing for a flag or for an oil company or for the king or freedom or the workers' revolution or whatever. Um, There's no explicit theology in that book. I wrote it for a secularist audience, and I think the argument can stand on its own terms, but I've been telling people that there's an implicit theology there, and it's really a book about idolatry. So what I intend to do in this next book is to make that implicit theology explicit. Uh, So to say that killing for the nation is not essentially different from killing for one's God is simply a a working out, I think, of the biblical critique of idolatry in the modern context. The Bible makes clear that people are spontaneously worshipping creatures who treat all sorts of things as if they were gods, and violence on their behalf is just one common manifestation of the urge to idolatry. But idolatry critique, of course, is not usually thought to work this, work this way. It's ten, it, people tend to think it works in the opposite uh, way. The biblical obsession with idolatry is often invoked as evidence of the violence of religion. It's often argued that belief in God or gods demands a kind of absolute loyalty that increases the stakes in any dispute until violence is licensed and so on. So the biblical obsession with idolatry is one symptom of this relentless religious demand for absolute and uncompromising loyalty to God and intolerance of others' beliefs and practices. People can see, that this is the way the argument goes, that other kinds of loyalty to one's family or one's country and so on are mundane matters, but there's nothing greater than God who by definition transcends all that. So loyalty to God has to take precedent to other loyalties and violence is the result. But I think, on the contrary, that the biblical critique of idolatry serves not to bolster but to undermine the argument that religion promotes violence. Because if the religion and violence notion, because it depends on this religious secular distinction, but the biblical critique of idolatry makes clear, I think, that the distinction doesn't hold, at least not in that way. In the biblical view, people are spontaneously worshiping creatures who treat all sorts of things as gods, golden calves and mute statues and mammon and even, as Paul says to the Philippians, their own bellies, right? The Bible recognizes only one true absolute, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but understands that people have a tendency to treat all sorts of created things as absolutes. So there's no neat distinction then between the world of worship of treating God as absolute and the world of mundane, purely secular pursuits, the fact is that worship, albeit false worship, pervades the so-called secular world, and there simply is no way to carve up the world into essentially a religious and the essentially secular if, in actual empirical fact, people treat all sorts of things as their religions. So the biblical critique of idolatry makes clear that the religious-secular distinction is an ideological rather than a purely descriptive distinction Uh, It doesn't articulate facts about the world so much as draw our attention to certain kinds of violence and away from our attention to other kinds of violence. If that's true then, though, I think the implications go far beyond the question of religion and violence. If the critique of idolatry calls the religious-secular distinction into question, then is it perhaps the case that we don't live in a secular age after all? Is Max Weber's tale of the disenchantment of modernity a tale which Charles Taylor accepts as axiomatic, simply false. The the book that I intend to write will be an attempt to puzzle through those kinds of questions. Now, I think it's too simple to declare that nothing has really changed, that we are as religious as we ever were, that science is a religion and nationalism is a religion and consumer is a religion and and so on. Clearly, something has changed, right? Wanting a new iPhone is not the same as bowing down and worshiping a golden calf. And yet, the biblical critique of idolatry would seem to require us to make a careful study into what has and what hasn't changed. And that's what I want to explore 
in a preliminary way today. So I want to start by discussing the treatment of idolatry in the Bible and then focus on a phenomenology of consumer behavior. So first, idolatry in the Bible. By the 1960s, most sociologists were convinced that religion was on the wane in the face of the rationalization of modernity. In the light of evidence, such as the emergence of liberation theology and militant Islam in the 1970s and the rapid growth of Christianity in Africa, the secularization thesis has been challenged and even some of its former proponents like Peter Berger have rejected it. So religion, we are told, has uh, made a comeback, but... I don't think that either the secularization thesis or the comeback of religion thesis is right. I think that worship um, has never, uh, worship hasn't made a comeback because it hasn't gone away. It never went away. The holy merely migrated in the modern era from the church to other realms like the state and the market. And that, I think, is congruent with what the Bible says about uh, idolatry. The Old Testament is filled with denunciations of idolatry in the form of worship of images of other gods and in the form of improper representations of the true God. The English term idol comes from the Greek eidolon, which indicates something that lacks substance or is vacuous. The Hebrew scriptures follow similar lines, referring to idols as things of naught, vanity, wind and confusion, the dead, and so on. The Old Testament sometimes mocks those who worship idols as worshiping what is merely material. Our God is in heaven. He creates what he chooses. They have idols of silver and gold made by human hands. These have mouths but say nothing, have eyes but see nothing, have ears but hear nothing, have noses but smell nothing. The book of Isaiah is incredulous that a man can use half a piece of wood for fire to cook his dinner and the other half to craft an idol to worship, never asking, am I right to bow down before a block of wood? As Moshe Halbertal and Abishai Margalit have argued in their analysis of idolatry in Jewish literature, however, the Hebrew Bible does not regard idolatry primarily as an error, as the mistaken belief that mere statues are in fact gods, The main problem is betrayal and not stupidity. So the biblical text generally assumes that the worship of other gods is a mere parody of the worship of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and that the other gods are not gods, lacking in substance and power. But the ban on idolatry does not necessarily deny the existence of other gods, but only forbids worshiping them. So idolatry is not primarily considered a metaphysical error. The key question is not what people believe, but how they behave. What constitutes idolatry is usually not the mistaken attribution of certain qualities to material objects, but the attitude of loyalty that people adopt toward created realities. Idolatry is primarily a way of life, in other words, not a metaphysical worldview. This is not to say that idolatry cannot be metaphysical, that people cannot attribute false being to gods that don't exist. It is only to say that the Bible appears to consider allegiance most commonly to be the decisive factor in separating idolatry from true worship. And that's why the primary biblical metaphors for idolatry are adultery and political disloyalty. The metaphor of adultery is exemplified by the story of Hosea, who's told to marry a whore to symbolize the dalliances of Israel with other gods, quote, for the country itself has become nothing but a whore by abandoning Yahweh. Halbertal and Margalit point out that the avoidance of anthropomorphism is not what distinguishes idolatry from true worship, since the rejection of idolatry in the Bible depends on comparing human relationships with God to other human relationships, like marriage. The rejection of idolatry then ironically depends on drawing similarities between God and humans, So a personal, somewhat anthropomorphized God is required to speak of idolatry because God must be a person in order to speak of betrayal. Loyalty must have been created within a history of specific relations, which is salvation history. The ban on idolatry is not universalistic in this sense, but depends on the concrete covenantal relations of a people to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. What is at stake is not so much metaphysical propositions about God or gods, therefore, but the devotion or lack thereof to the one true God. The other metaphor, then, is uh, political loyalty. The Israelites are also warned against exchanging the kingship of God for that of human kings. As God says to Samuel, when the people ask for a king to be like other nations, 
It is not you they have rejected, but me, not wishing me to reign over them anymore. They are now doing to you exactly what they have done to me since the day I brought them out of Egypt till now, deserting me and serving other gods, right? Um, I'm, <laughs> emphasis added, sorry. Um, <laughs> In comparison to the marital metaphor, however, the political metaphor for idolatry is somewhat less exclusive. You can't have a stand-in for your spouse, but human kings can be seen as God's agents, provided that they depend on God. In contrast to the kings of other nations who set themselves up as gods, the monarchy is not to be seen as part of the cosmic order, but only as a result of a stubborn people's request. God's favor can rest upon the king, but only if the king learns to fear God and does not accumulate horses and wives and wealth, as it says in Deuteronomy 17. As Isaiah makes plain, pride is the root sin. root sin. Kings are not to trust their own power or that of human allies. Quote, woe to those going down to Egypt for help who put their trust in horses, who rely on quantity of chariots, and on great strength of cavalrymen, but do not look to the Holy One of Israel. In this passage, Isaiah continues on to link this turning away from God with the idolatrous reliance on what is created instead of the Creator. Quote, the Egyptian is human, not divine. His horses are flesh, not spirit. End quote. Here, idolatry is not fundamentally a matter of mistaking material things for God, nor of consciously attributing God's attributes like immortality and omnipotence to an earthly king, the key question is one of trust. Kings are guilty of idolatry and self-deification when they rely upon their own power and neglect the source of true power. So their subjects are guilty of idolatry when they transfer unconditional obedience from God to king. So two conclusions then come from this political metaphor of idolatry. First, idolatry is not necessarily a black and white issue. It's rare that someone makes a golden calf and says, here is your God who brought you out of Egypt. Most forms of idolatry, like trust, are on a continuum of more or less. Israel is suffered to have kings, but only with a great deal of ambivalence. Sometimes they're instruments of God's purposes, sometimes not so much. Second, then, if idolatry doesn't depend on the deliberate attribution of divine qualities to human kings then it may be the case that political idolatry did not die with the ancient empires. The divine right of kings, the transfer of sovereignty to the modern state, the glorification of the nation, the reliance on military might, the threat to destroy the world through nuclear weapons to ensure one's own survival. Um, All of these and more make putting one's trust in horses to look positively meek. Along with circumcision, kosher laws, and Sabbath observance, anti-idolatry was one of the prime markers of Jewish identity in the Greco-Roman period. And although Christians departed from Jews on the first three markers, there's substantial continuity with regard to the critique of idolatry. And once again, the critique of idolatry is not restricted to the explicit and intentional worship of gods with other names but rather pertains to the disproportionate devotion shown to all manner of created things. Though explicit mention of idolatry is rare in the Gospels, Jesus' admonition about God and mammon in the Sermon on the Mount makes clear that people are prone to serve money as a god and that one must choose between the true god and the false one. The Greek word for serve here, douluein, is most commonly used for the master-slave relationship and allegiance to transcendent beings. And the term mammon is left untranslated so that it sounds like a proper name, like the name of a god. Jesus' warning is given in the context of other sayings and on trust, uh, on, uh, other sayings on trust in God over worries about material goods. The saying against storing up treasures on earth is concluded with, quote, for whatever, where, wherever your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Idolatry, again, is not so much a matter of conceptual error as devotion. One could be perfectly clear conceptually that coins are made of earthly metals and not divine, they are not divine beings, and yet one can be an idolater if one trusts them to provide security, right? Um, 401ks maybe being the most up-to-date kind of um, example of this. Function, then, not belief, is the most common marker of idolatry. And that, I think, is especially clear in the Pauline letters where idolatry takes a more prominent place than in the Gospels. 
Colossians follows the general idea from the Old Testament that idolatry is devotion to what is earthly as opposed to what is heavenly. That is why you must kill everything in you that is earthly, sexual vice, impurity, uncontrolled passion, evil desires, and especially greed, which is the same thing as worshiping a false god. In Paul's letter to the Philippians, he bemoans those who are destined to be lost. Their God is their stomach or their bellies. They glory in what they should think shameful since their minds are set on earthly things. Okay, so a brief run through there of um, biblical thought on idolatry. I want to um, uh, bring this into the modern context now. Um, if greed and devotion to mammon constitute the worship of false gods. The question then becomes, as Pope Francis has raised repeatedly, is contemporary society as religious as it ever was, just in an idolatrous sort of way? Now that, I don't think, is a particularly novel idea. When it is expressed, however, it tends to be expressed rather loosely and vaguely. It's often expressed with the understanding that it's just a metaphor, right? We say capitalism is a religion, but they're not really, it's not really a religion. Or um, you do take the idea of idolatry in economic matters more literally, as Pope Francis seems to be doing, but there's little attempt to sort out and analyze the various aspects of economic behavior and how they work, right? Are the negative effects of capitalism simply due to the age-old sin of greed? Is greed the same thing as consumerism? Do people expect the same or different things from products as they do from gods, and so on. If we're not going to regard consumerism as religion as just a metaphor, then I think a closer analysis of these and similar questions is needed. There is a a growing body of empirical studies examining the religious nature of consumerism. An article entitled The Sacred and the Profane in Consumer Behavior typifies this approach. In it, marketing professors Russell Belk, Melanie Wallendorf, and John Sherry analyze social scientific data on consumer behavior and conclude that what characterizes the sacred, that is, objects set apart and accorded reverence, is also typical of consumer behavior, although such commodities are usually considered profane because they have no connection to formal religion. The authors argue that Quote, two processes at work in contemporary society are the secularization of religion and the sacralization of the secular. Um, Jose Casanova said the same thing. Consumer behavior shapes and reflects these processes, end quote. Though they identify border crossings between the religion and the secular, they don't actually question the artificially constructed nature of that border. A recent series of empirical studies by researchers from the universities of Tel Aviv, New York, and Duke found that those subjects with strong traditional religious ties were much less likely to choose name brands for products than that are used as a form of self-expression. So their study, which was published in, published in the journal Marketing Science under the title Brands, the Opiate of the Non-Religious Masses, concludes that consumer behavior and brand loyalty function as substitutes for traditional religion. Significantly, however, religiosity is defined for the sake of the study in terms of self-expression, such that brands and religion function as substitutes in expressing self-worth. Religion is here defined not as worship of an other, but as an expression of the self. Charles Taylor thinks that this is... this. It is precisely this interiorization of religious belief that marks our disenchanted and secular age as opposed to the previous enchanted and religious one. According to Taylor, everyone can agree that one of the big differences between us and our ancestors of 500 years ago is that they lived in an enchanted world and we do not. Taylor describes this difference as a difference in sensibility or existential condition And he contrasts the modern world with the enchanted medieval world. Quote, the world of spirits, demons, moral forces, which our predecessors acknowledged. The process of disenchantment is the disappearance of this world and the substitution of what we live today. A world in which the only locus of thoughts, feelings, spiritual elan is what we call minds. The only minds in the cosmos are those of humans and minds are bounded so that these thoughts, feelings, etc. are situated within them, 
In an enchanted world, according to Taylor, meaning resides out there in spirits and in things like relics and other holy objects. In a disenchanted world, things continue to induce meaning within us, but in an enchanted world, things affect not only us, but other things in the world. So saints, for example, have magical powers to stop lightning. Charged things can impose meanings in an enchanted world, and because this meaning resides in the external world, we think of this meaning as including us, or perhaps penetrating us. And this is why he says, meaning in an enchanted world is neither holy within nor holy without the person, but selves are porous, as he says. People describe themselves as taken over by evil or in the grip of melancholy, A modern person, by way of contrast, can consider melancholy as being a function of body chemistry and so can take distance from it. So Taylor says that modern selves are buffered. There's this more of a a strong boundary between interior and exterior. According to Taylor, the process of disenchantment is irreversible. What he means by disenchantment, however, is not necessarily the loss of religious belief, but the interiorization of belief such that any belief is subjective and optional. It's not just that people believe different things that they used to, but the conditions of belief have changed. It was once nearly impossible not to believe in God. Now belief in God is just one option among many. And optionality, then, is the chief effect of disenchantment. Optionality doesn't seem to be optional for us in Taylor's description. What I'm trying to describe here, he says, is not a theory. Rather, my target is our contemporary lived understanding. That is, the way we naively take things to be. We might say the construal we just live in without ever being aware of it as a construal or without ever formulating it, end quote. According to Taylor, quote, the main feature of this new context is that it puts an end to the naive acknowledgement of the transcendent or of goals or claims which go beyond human flourishing. Naivete, he says, is now unavailable to anyone, believer or unbeliever alike, end quote. Except, of course, as he himself says, the naivete of optionality, which is not only available but mandatory for everyone. So that, I think, is an interesting kind of uh, tension in Taylor's work. Naivete is no longer available except the naivete of optionality. His notion of optionality would seem to put to rest the idea of consumerism as false worship, right? To bow down before an idol is clearly different than treating it as an optional item of consumption. And in his ironic approach, Taylor steers well clear of any mention of idolatry. But idolatry critique haunts his contention that purely imminent accounts of awe and mystery may be inadequate to their object. Taylor mentions the way that the dense communal ritual life of Breton parishes have given way to post-war consumer culture, commenting, quote, it is almost as though the conversion was a response to a stronger form of magic as earlier conversions had been. Now here the word almost, of course, protects Taylor's thesis of the irreversibility of disenchantment and the exceptional character of modernity from unraveling. But the almost also seems to represent this kind of unthought in Taylor's own work. And this unthought surfaces from time to time in Taylor's work. Taylor acknowledges, for example, that secular life continues to employ symbolism, but he's convinced that disenchantment is decisive, it's unique, it's irreversible. And so he claims that symbols have fundamentally different effects on human subjects than they used to. So he says, look, of course we go on having rituals. We salute the flag, etc. But the efficacy here is inner. We are, in the best case, transformed psychologically. We come out feeling more dedicated. The symbol now invokes in the sense that it awakens the thought of the meaning in us. We are no longer dealing with a real presence we can now speak of an act as only symbolic. Now, I think he's right that we do indeed speak this way. We've learned to describe patriotic rituals as only symbolic, our willingness to kill and die for the nation as secular, the nation's pursuits in war as purely mundane and therefore not fanatical, 
The question, though, is not only whether or not these descriptions do justice to the phenomena being described, but also, and more crucially, what kind of political work these descriptions are doing. It may be, for example, that our descriptions of patriotic ritual as only symbolic, only imminent, only secular, help to keep our actions on behalf of the nation free from the charge of idolatry. Nationalism is not a religion, we have learned to say, and so persons whose Christianity, uh, person whose, persons whose religion is Christianity may kill for the nation and be a follower of the Prince of Peace at the same time with no apparent conflict with, between the two. For a secularist, the description of patriotic ritual as only symbolic might work in another way. It might, for example, help to establish a sharp divide between our violence which is in pursuit of rational and mundane goods, and their violence, usually meaning Muslims, which is fanatical and in pursuit of transcendent and illusory goals. So our violence doesn't really count as violence, their violence does. So there is perhaps then a gap between belief and behavior, even in a so-called reflective society that has shed its naivete, and I don't think Taylor does justice to that, Taylor does seem to recognize a gap of this nature near the end of his book, A Secular Age, when he drops his descriptive tone and contends modes of fullness recognized by exclusive humanisms and others that remain within the imminent frame are therefore responding to transcendent reality but misrecognizing it. You you lose this because it's it's already like 700 pages into the book or something, but... um, (laughs) Uh, But it's buried there. It's this kind of unthought that keeps, you know, Taylor as a Catholic. uh, I think he he really wants to say this. The same contention is at the heart, I think, of biblical critiques of idolatry, right? The idolater is looking for God in all the wrong places. Idolatry critique names the gap between our behaviors and our descriptions of our behaviors. I think that's, let, let me say that again. Idolatry critique names the gap between our behaviors and our descriptions of our behaviors. In the modern context, if optionality has become our naivete, as Taylor himself says, then our descriptions of our own beliefs and behaviors will unavoidably be structured by a larger political context that escapes our notice. As Hent de Vries puts it, if there were ever such a thing as optionality, then it could never leave behind a certain level of implicitness, an unthought and lack of choice of sorts. Its eventual expression could never satisfy our need for discursive articulation and conceptual explicitness. So whether or not something is called enchanted or disenchanted is at least in part then, I think, a political question. So are we enchanted or disenchanted? I think rather than try to sort that question out once and for all, like which kinds uh, or conditions of belief and behavior are enchanted and which are not, I think a more adequate approach would be to ask in any given circumstance, what kind of political work is the label enchanted or disenchanted or religious and secular doing? Taylor is, of course, right to insist that something important has changed from the medieval to the modern. Most people no longer believe that their world is inhabited by demons and fairies and other supernatural beings. To describe this change, though, as the Entzauberung der Welt, right, the the disenchantment, the the taking away of sauber magic, as uh, Weber does and Taylor follows him, I think that misses the way that the holy may have migrated to other locations. Western modernity is perhaps not entirely as exceptional and the course of history not as entirely irreversible as Taylor would have us believe. It is the case that secularity is marked by an interiorization of the holy and a disappearance of gods and fairies and demons and so on from the external world. Taylor's language of disenchantment, though, seems to miss the extent to which a stronger form of magic, in his words, still works on secular people and the power that the misrecognition of that fact wields in a secular society. What Taylor's account needs, I suggest, is a close analysis of that misrecognition And I think the basic biblical theme of idolatry can help. What's needed, though, is a concept of idolatry that's attentive to the process of interiorization 
that Taylor rightly identifies as a mark of the secular age. So I think we need a concept of idolatry to tease out this idea of misrecognition, but it has to be an idolatry that deals with this interiorization that I think he's rightly pointed to. And such an interiorized view of idolatry, for that I'm uh, turning to Jean-Luc Marion's analysis of the idol and the icon. Like the Bible, Marion makes clear that idols are not a particular class of objects. The idol and the icon, he says, determine two manners of being for beings, not two classes of beings. So the world is not neatly divided into idols and icons. Uh, The same thing can pass from idol to icon and vice versa. What determines its status is is the subject's gaze. As in Taylor's modernity, meaning is not in any simple way located in the object itself, but in the subject. For Marion, however, the possibility of human enchantment with material objects is not diminished by the primacy of the subject over the object. Indeed, idolatry for Marion is precisely a condition in which the subject finds itself mirrored in the object, and the gaze of the subject becomes all in all. So idolatry, according to Marion is the interiorization of the experience of the divine. According to Marion, quote, it is characterized solely by the subjection of the divine to the human conditions for experience of the divine, concerning which nothing proves that it is not authentic, end quote. The human then becomes the measure of the divine, which is certainly a type of misrecognition, but Marion does not deny that an experience of the divine lies behind the idolatrous gaze, Quote, in the cases of life and death, peace and war, love and drunkenness, spirit and beauty, we indisputably experience the irrepressible and panic capital of the divine. It's a great quote, the panic capital of the divine. And we decipher or divine therein faces that we model in order that we might fix so many gods in them. End quote. So the problem is that in cutting the divine to a human measure, the human ends up divinizing the self. The intention of the gaze is not to see itself. Idolatry is not simple narcissism. It is rather the case, according to Marion, that the gaze attempts to transcend itself and aim for the divine by searching for the divine among visible material objects. Before the idol, the gaze does not see what is visible since the gaze finds nothing to stop it. But the more ardently the gaze seeks, the more it will tend to be dazzled by an object upon which the gaze will rest. So the idolatrous gaze becomes captivated by the object and fails to see the creator God transparent in the object. Quote, in this stop, the gaze ceases to overshoot and transpierce itself, and hence it ceases to transpierce visible things in order to pause in the splendor of one of them. End quote. So as radar strikes an object and reports back to the transmitter its own position in relation to the object, so the gaze comes to find itself in the idol. The idol thus acts as a mirror, not as a portrait, a mirror that reflects the gaze's image, or more exactly, the image of its aim and the scope of that aim. The idol does not reveal itself as a mirror, however. The idol fills the gaze, saturates it, and dazzles it so the mirror function is obscured, it's misrecognized, we might say. The gaze is not able to engage in idolatry critique because, Marion explains, it no longer has the means to do so. The aim stops, stops at the idol and is enveloped by it. Now, Marion's phenomenological account of idolatry is critical, but it's free of the kind of biblical polemics that you find in Isaiah 44 where the idolater is mocked. Marion repeatedly emphasizes that there is no deception or illusion in the idol. The idol simply shows what occupies the field of the visible. The idolater is not duped, but simply ravished. Idolatry is not a metaphysical error, a mistaken belief in fairies or demons or other things that don't really exist in the external world. There's no sense in Marion that idolatry comes from a pre-scientific naivete about the way the world works. Nor does idolatry, Marion writes, even originate in an ethical choice. Idolatry rather, he says, reveals a sort of essential fatigue. 
it, it's hard to maintain this aim that seeks to transpierce the visible. It's hard to keep looking for God without rest or end. Idolatry offers not an illegitimate spectacle, but a place to rest. Quote, starting with the idol, the aim no longer progresses, but no longer aiming returns upon itself, it reflects itself, and by this reflex abandons as unbearable to live the invisible. Unbearable to live the invisible. I mean, how many of us have felt that kind of fatigue with God? I think what Marion's analysis suggests, and that's, just makes you want to go shopping, doesn't it? Um, seri- yeah, I'm, I'm half serious about that. I think what Marion's analysis suggests is that what Taylor calls the imminent frame to which our contemporary imagination seems confined is not simply a sober disenchantment, but it lends itself, in fact, to a type of enchantment, a type of idolatry that results in a bedazzlement of, with the world of objects, What Marion adds to Augustine's account of idolatry is the essentially self-referential and mirrored nature of the idolatrous gaze, what he calls, quote, the gaze gazing at itself gazing at the risk of seeing no more than its own face without perceiving in it the gaze that gazes, right? So it's not the object itself, it's the mirror function. The self is not absorbed in the object The reverse is the case. At some point, desire takes leave of the object and turns back upon itself in an enchanted circle that's hard to break open. Let me say that again. At some point, desire takes leave of the object and turns back upon itself in an enchanted circle that's hard to break open. So I think that Marion's analysis is useful in that it suggests that idols can be mirrors of the self and not simply spectacles, Where he fails to capture the contemporary situation, I think, though, is in his emphasis on rest. It is certainly true that the idolatrous gaze fails to transpierce the object to detect the presence of the creator God. The consumer self, though, does not so much rest in the object, but continually moves from one object to the next. Marion himself hints in one passage in God Without Being hints at this in this passage in which he seems to lament the ease with which we desert idolatry, passing through museums and temples lacking the expectation of fulfillment. And Marion comments cryptically, often we do not have or no longer have the means for such a splendid idolatry, right? As if idolatry were a superior achievement to the mere flitting from one object to another. So even Marx's analysis of commodity fetishism then, I think, might be outdated. In a late capitalist consumer society, Marion's phenomenology of the self-referential nature of the idolatrous gaze seems particularly pertinent, though it needs supplementing with an account of the transitory nature of contemporary desire. In a consumer society, desire does not fixate on objects, but moves from object to object, Consumer desire is not exactly the same as the age-old sin of greed. Detachment, not attachment, characterizes consumers' economy. Consumers must continually be dissatisfied with their possessions so that the wheels of production continue to move. It's not buying but shopping that captures the heart of consumerism. So dissatisfaction and satisfaction cease to be opposites because pleasure is not in the object, but in the desire itself. That is, I think, the point that I'm trying to get at. Pleasure is not in the object, but in the desire itself. And if you look at the trajectory of advertising over the 20th century, I think this supports this idea. So if you look at um, shoe advertising across the 20th century, in the early 20th century, you get... um, and I, I just picked shoes um, uh, because it made for a handy example, but you can pick uh, any kind of advertising. And what you find in early 20th century advertising are uh, tightly worded um, scripts kind of explaining why, uh, explaining the virtues of the product being advertised and why you ought to prefer this and why you ought to buy this. Um, by mid-century, however, the text has mostly gone away uh, through the influence of Leo Burnett and others. 
And so um, advertising makes fewer arguments in favor of products and tries instead to associate products with non-material aspirations like sex and status and freedom and so on. What had happened in the meantime is Freud and Pavlov, right? Um, Freud, uh, the idea that you don't appeal to people's rash, rational sense, but you appeal to, to their irration, irrational urges. And uh, Pavlov, um, I mean, if you take a look at this, uh, this advertising, the, uh, the consumer looking at the advertisement is the dog, uh, the shoe is the bell, and the woman is the meat, right? Um, it's, the, it's the same kind of bait and switch that was going on in, in Pavlov. By the end of the 20th century and into the 21st century, on the other hand, the product has dropped out almost entirely, but this is, this is kind of what, uh, what it's become. Advertising often takes leave of the product itself. As Naomi Klein and others have pointed out, what matters is not the product, but the brand. Corporations through outsourcing have tried to shed their bodies to concentrate on the mysticism surrounding the brand, and online merchant- merchandising just exacerbates this trend. Klein says, quote, liberated from the real world burdens of stores and product manufacturing, these brands are free to soar, less as the disseminators of goods and services than as collective hallucinations. I like that, collective hallucinations. So brands, not products, are what matters precisely because brands say something about the product, or I'm sorry, not about the product, but about the person who associates him or herself with the brand. As Bernd Vonnenvetsch writes, actual products are reduced to mere footnotes in a drama which features desire as a one-man show. Desire has no telos. Desire has been liberated from dependence on objects because humans have been defined as creatures who ceaselessly desire, and it doesn't really matter so much for what. The desire is to be alive, to cease desiring, for desire to come to a rest is to be among the living dead. The fear that the new drug fliber, flib, ah, flibanserin, which is also being called the female Viagra, I think addresses this fear that we will cease to desire. And this desire for desire, as Von Invech writes, quote, lays bare the fact that for all capitalism's obsession with objects of accumulation, the secret idol of its economy of desire has always been man or woman, him or herself. So, in summary then, it seems to me that an adequate account of idolatry in a secular world will have to leave behind Taylor's and Weber's account of disenchantment. So the people waiting at midnight on Thanksgiving to burst into the electronics store and run madly for the discount TVs are not buffered selves, right? Um, There must be some Canadian equivalent of this, I don't know, but... um, uh, America, uh, yeah, you, you know the story, right? The, uh, in, in the American Thanksgiving now, the stores open up the next day at midnight uh, on Black Friday and offer these tremendous deals. Uh, at the same time, though, an adequate, an adequate account of idolatry today, I think, has to reckon with Taylor's account of interiorization. The aspiration for consumer goods is not a flight towards, but a flight away from the material world an example of what Taylor calls excarnation as a typical feature of modernity. Let me say that again. The aspiration for consumer goods is not a flight towards, but away from the material world, an example of what Taylor calls excarnation as a typical feature of modernity. Um, One final word about idolatry critique, though. Um, I think it should contain equal parts criticism and sympathy Um, It should always, first and foremost, be self-critique, for one thing, and the church, of course, is more guilty of this than anybody else. But the model, I think, should be Paul in Acts 17. On the one hand, Paul is distressed by the Athenians' idolatry. They are deesi daimonesterus, which the the King James Version translates as too superstitious, but the NRSV renders as extremely religious. So on the one hand, Paul sees their idolatry as a searching for the true God. I'm sorry, on the other hand, Paul, so on the one hand, he 
He condemns their idolatry, but on the other hand, he sees their idolatry as a searching for the true God. Paul wishes to reveal to them that the true name of the unknown God they worship is the God of Jesus Christ, the true God whom the Athenians misrecognized made all the nations, quote, so that they would search for God and perhaps grope for him and find him, though indeed he is not far from each one of us. And idolatry, I think, is precisely that longing and groping for the true God. So thank you. I'm going to stop there.